Welcome everyone to another exciting episode of CRE Exchange. I'm Cole Perry, your host and senior market analyst at Altus Group, a leading provider of asset and fund intelligence. I'm joined by Omar Elterai, our U.S. Director of Research. Uh, together, we'll share the latest news and trends in the U.S. commercial real estate market. Omar, it's uh, great to be with you. Glad to be here. Looks like we got a lot to cover on the podcast. What uh, What's on today's list of topics? Sure. So we had a, a pretty packed week last week. Uh, so we'll run through an overview of uh, some of the Fed news. Um, then we'll touch on a number of the macro releases and uh, check in on the markets, touching on fixed income, equities. Uh, we'll even do a little bit of commodities and, and see where the REITs are as well. And then we'll do a, a recent retail chain closures and downsizing. This is a, a piece that Cole, I know you focused on and have, have looked into. And then uh, we'll close it out with some of the items that we're looking forward to uh, uh, digesting later this week. All right. Sounds good. What uh, What do you want to get into first? Sure. So uh, it was a really week last week uh, in terms of uh, news and speeches coming, coming out from the Fed. Uh, but I would say the possibly most anticipated and digested uh, Fed news uh, or really nugget of news from the past week was the release of the April 30th uh, to May 1st FOMC meeting minutes, uh, which really drove home the higher for longer narrative um, as the minutes really confirmed that many of the members of the FOMC uh, view inflation as taking longer to tame than they had previously expected and that multiple of the voting members were open to additional hikes if needed. Now, I'm not saying that, that uh, they were putting hikes back on the table and back on the calendar, but uh, they, they did, uh, that they were, it's not a, a unique opinion amongst the FOMC members that if inflation does not come down, uh, that they would consider hikes if needed. Uh, but these views were really, and, and the meeting minutes, I would say, uh, were really colored by many, many speeches that, that happened last week. So on Monday, you had Governor Christopher Waller uh, and Vice Chair uh, for Supervision, Michael Barr, as well as the Vice Chair, uh, Philip Jefferson, give speeches. Then on Tuesday, uh, uh, Regional Fed President of the Cleveland Fed, uh, Loretta Mester, uh, gave a speech, as well as Governor Waller again spoke at the Peterson Institute. Um, and Governor Waller was quite busy because he, on, on Friday, uh, had another uh, uh, speech at the Reykjavik um, Economic Conference in Iceland. Um, but across all of these speeches, the Fed officials really, they shared their current views on the economy and monetary policy. Um, However, I had to boil it down to really three things. Um, many of the, these speeches plus the FOMC minutes uh, really did three, three things. One, they admitted that the initial estimates for how fast inflation would come down were off, right? So uh, they admitted that inflation was taking longer to cool than in initially anticipated. Second, uh, they, the speeches and the minutes uh, really made observations on the, the current environment. Uh, they, they, they called attention to the, the fact that we are in a restrictive territory in terms of interest rates, but the speed of the transmission of that cool down uh, of the higher rates through the economy is still really being assessed uh, and, and understood. And then the third thing or theme that I, I thought the speeches and the minutes uh, called attention to is that there's really a need for more time as well as really more data um, before any sort of interest rate moves, whether that's up, hopefully not, or down, um, and any sort of cuts um, are going to be really decided upon. Um, and so more time and more data um, will, will bring clarity to the situation. Cole, I know you were looking at uh, many of the, the, the macro releases that, that did come out. What was, what, was, what was the first one that uh, caught your attention? 
Yeah, so I took a long look at some housing data last week. I think uh, this is one of the particular data points that has kind of clouded the view on um, interest rates because, uh, you know, whether directly because interest rates for, how uh, you know, purchasing house housing is uh, are still elevated or because housing inflation is still very high. Um, and so there was data last week um, on new and existing home sales. So the uh, Census Bureau and Department of Housing and Urban Development release a joint report um, on single family home sales or new single family home sales that came out on May 23rd. Uh, so that release showed that new home sales declined 4.7% from the previous month, um, but also 7.7% from uh, the previous year. And so they're now at, at a seasonally adjusted annual rate of uh, 665,000 sales. Um, so you know, those elevated mortgage rates are definitely uh, constraining sales of existing homes. So a lot of that demand has been channeled into new home construction. Um, but uh, you're seeing that market slip a bit too. So this is, uh, the, it's no longer gaining any steam. Uh, April, 2024 actually marked the first yearly decline in sales of new homes since February, 2023. And uh, I, this is one that I calculated on top of this, but uh, the uh, fraction of sales attributed to new homes did slip quite a bit from their recent peak. So it, uh, its recent peak was 15% of the total sales. Um, and now it's around 13.3% for April, 2024. So, um, you know, this probably isn't bad news to everybody because the slimming construction pipeline for new homes, uh, can that demand is just going to get channeled into the multifamily and presumably some existing uh, single family rental markets. So interesting stuff there on new sales uh, or on new home sales, uh, existing home sales. Uh, that's a figure from the National Association of Realtors. So April data for that figure came out on May 22nd. So just the day before, I like those line up quite closely. Um, and uh, that showed that existing home sales did slip from March, 2024, 1.9%. Uh, and the same amount actually from uh, April, 2023. So that uh, showed uh, existing home sales at a seasonally adjusted annual rate of uh, a little over 4 million. So uh, the other thing that, re that this release includes is pricing data. Um, and so in uh, April, 2024, the median price of a, an existing home actually increased 5.7% on the year uh, to just above $400,000. Uh, all four regions of the country. So uh, those that the NAR uses, Northeast, South, Midwest, and West, uh, they did post price gains on the year. Um, you know, I think the story is pretty similar here. Elevated prices, low inventory. Um, they're really just pushing folks into the multifamily sector. So uh, this is a sector we've covered on the podcast before, and we're not the first people to point this out, but it is grappling with some uh, major growth in supply in select markets. You're seeing some year-on-year -year declines in rent growth. But if all this demand gets channeled in the multifamily sector, maybe you'll see a little bit of that kind of stem, stem the bleeding in that sector. Uh, the other figure I looked at last week, this was uh, related to manufacturing. So uh, the durable goods orders uh, data release. So this is the uh, durable goods manufacturers, shipments, inventories, and orders uh, data release from the Census Bureau. That's a monthly advance report. Um, so they'll go back and correct the previous month's figures uh, next month. Uh, but uh, they released this report on May 24th. Uh, so we saw that new orders for manufactured durable goods rose 0.7% month over month uh, to a seasonally adjusted value of $284 billion. So uh, orders did fall from one year ago, 0.9%. Uh, one reason we should probably look at this indicator um, and one that you may not think of when you hear manufactured durable goods is that one of the big categories of those goods is actually construction equipment. And so this is a good leading indicator of where, um, you know, where the future economic environment is headed um, for something like construction. Um, but also it's a direct demand driver for the industrial sector. And uh, April 2024 actually represented the second yearly contraction um, in durable goods orders since 2020. So this is a market that, you know, this is a figure that's actually shown uh, quite a bit of positivity in the future economic environment. But um you know, as a, as a demand driver for industrial real estate, we are seeing this figure slip a little bit. So 
growth in spending is cooling. Um, and uh, so the effects may be felt directly uh, in demand for warehouse space. So probably something we should keep an eye on. It's one of those figures where you might want to see if uh, you know, growth in spending is keeping up with inflation, um, but it, it looks like now the value is actually slipping on a yearly basis. And so it should be interesting to see where this is felt in the rest of the economy. Um, but I think you can give us a good idea of what's going on in some of the markets to shed some light on that. Uh, what were you taking a look at these last few weeks? Sure. I wanted to do a quick check in across the, you know, broader capital markets, uh, across fixed income equities. And I know that commodities are getting a little bit more play and a little bit more attention. Um, so I just wanted to put some of these into context. So with all the news and releases from last week, yields on the benchmark interest rates and bonds um, for the week really notched up about uh, seven basis points. Um, and that puts the the 10 year uh, U.S. the yield on the 10 year uh U.S. Treasury security at 4.46 um, and the five-year at 4.53. That's where they closed out last week. Um, and where those interest rates are currently, uh, that's about 50 uh, to 60 basis points higher than at the start of 2024. Now I'm speaking for the 10-year and the five-year respectively, um, but both are uh, right around that 75 basis points higher than where they were a year ago. Um, now, while the higher bond yields uh, from last week did weigh uh, pretty heavily on uh, equities, um, the broad market equity indices, uh, which uh, those that are most cited uh, are, are quite concentrated. Uh, they, they're concentrated in, in, uh, in sectors and specifically a handful of companies that uh, um, were able to largely shake off uh, a lot of that um, higher higher bond yield. And um, the broad market indices are still up around uh, 10 to 11% year to date uh, and about 25 to 30% uh, over the last 12 months. Well, that's speaking for uh, broad broad-based uh, equities market uh, indices, uh, the REITs uh, are not in the, not quite in the same camp um, as they were down. Uh, they finished last week down about 3%, um, and that puts them uh, down about 7% year to date. And um, I guess silver lining is that they're actually up uh, about 8% over the last 12 months. Um, but they, they still, you know, real estate is still one of those, uh, one of the sectors that, um, doesn't necessarily have, uh, you know, the, the growth, uh, that is, uh, really booing certain sectors of, uh, equities, uh, and really allowing them to shake off these, these higher yields. Um, checking in on commodities, just because commodities have gotten a lot more attention recently. Uh, part of that is due to uh, geopolitics that you know and geopolitical risk. Uh, but another big piece is um, that there's a bit more divergence that we're seeing a across across the globe in terms of economies and how they the the, the strength and the, their growth um, expectations, uh, as well as uh, central bank uh, monetary policy. As that diverges, you're starting to see both oil, which uh, often is uh, tied heavily to, to overall economic growth, but then also gold uh, really come, in, come into uh, the, I would say, the mainstream commentary around how markets are performing. Uh, as of last week on all of the news, uh, both oil and gold futures ended the week down, uh, but both are between 10 to, to 13% up year to date. Um, and uh, ultimately, the, uh, you know, I think that these are going to be, it, it's worth paying a, a bit more attention to going forward as um, um, you'll see the really uh, come into play uh, much more and help, help describe what's happening 
as, as the uh, economies and central banks diverge. Um, I, I know that was a, we don't usually do that kind of like broad cross asset class breakdown. Um, but uh, thought we'd give that a try. But uh, heading into this week, I do know that all uh, all investor eyes will be on uh, inflation data, which we'll 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 touch on um, in a in you know at the end of the call. Um, but uh, turning to CRE, uh, Cole, I know that you recently have uh, done a piece looking at uh, retail chains and how they're adjusting their 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 portfolios and their their footprint. Uh, what do you have to share there? I, I did want to call back to something you mentioned earlier. For those folks who do want to get that zoom in on on REIT specifically, we've had a couple of uh, recent episodes that shed some light on uh, some individual sectors and companies. We did a REIT overview a few weeks ago, and then we just had a conversation with Ed Pierzak from NAREIT. So if folks want to kind of zoom in on uh, some of those individual sectors or, or companies, I'd encourage them to take a look at those other episodes. Um, but, you know, uh, I did recently post a piece to the Altus website about uh, retail kind of downsizing and portfolio right sizing, but I, I didn't do this in a vacuum. There have been some recent, recent stories uh, touching on some, some similar topics. There is a Wall Street Journal piece uh, just last week, or I guess on May 21st, um, about drugstores and pharmacies. Uh, so they're finally downsizing that was the title was uh, real estate downsizing finally comes for your pharmacy uh the story uh essentially was that drugstores and pharmacies were among the last categories of major retailers to downsize um you know amidst discount competitors and e-commerce um and so there was some data from some other providers estimating that there have been about three thousand uh, pharmacies have actually closed over the last five years um so uh the kind of punchline to that particular story was that it's not all bad um, because availability for standalone buildings, um, particularly those for pharmacies, was at all-time lows. And so these are tending to backfill quickly. Um, another story last week, this has made some, some serious waves across kind of the restaurant world, but Red Lobster filed for bankruptcy. Um, and so that was following an, a, uh, an announcement of a couple of uh, recent closures, um, and then they filed for Chapter 11 last week. So their executives, interestingly, credit uh, the downfall of the chain to uh, uh, specific sale leaseback provision. It was an agreement they signed back in 2021 where they sold their underlying real estate um, and rented it back. Their executives now claim that this is that they've been renting the particular land at, uh, above the prevailing market rent. Um, they've stated that they might have to close locations in the near future. Um, but I bring all this up to say that a bit earlier than some of those recent uh, pieces, uh, I did a nice overview of the uh, kind of recent retail trends. Uh, some other chains who have hit turbulence, who are downsizing, they're outright liquidating or they're spinning off or just trimming down existing locations into smaller format stores. Um, and uh, so I talked a little bit about how institutional capital in real estate is reacting to, to these trends. Um, if chains are kind of going small, uh, you see, you've seen institutional capital do the same. Uh, they're pivoting away from, say, the mall sector, which is really capital intensive, um, and towards higher value, smaller footprint shopping centers. So. Um, some data from NACREF I took a look at, and the average size of a retail property owned by an institutional fund uh, has reduced by nearly a third since 2000, but the average value of, an, of a property owned has actually tripled. Um, and so you've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of this consolidation into, say, the, the grocery sector, um, a lot of these high foot traffic um, centers where the uh, tenants actually take care of a lot of the maintenance um, and uh, they have sort of a symbiotic relationship as opposed to the like real science that is uh, crafting uh, malls. Uh, but, um, you know, I would say that a lot of these recent closures have not been uh, all negative for uh, institutional owners. They've been actually fairly successful at splitting up these anchor stores uh, replacing inline tenants. Uh, you've seen market to contract rent spreads actually 
Uh, they're positive and they're increasing. And so replacing a lot of these stores that were there on long leases, say like drugstores, pharmacies, other big box locations we've seen close like Bed Bath & Beyond, uh, they've actually been quite uh, positive for, uh, for institutional ownership of retail real estate. Um, and this era of kind of elevated consumer spending that we've been in following the pandemic has, has really been a boon for, for these type of uh, centers. Um, but I actually also spoke recently with the uh, Commercial Observer. Um, there was a, an article I appeared in on uh, May 21st um, about the uh, grocery sector called Ace in the Hole, refer referring to Whole Foods. Um, talking a little bit about how this sector is evolving, talking about some of the chains that are doing quite well in this elevated uh, consumer spending environment. So I encourage folks to check that out. I think you may have to have a subscription because it was in the Commercial Observer magazine, um, but I uh, definitely encourage folks to check that out. I always love talking about the grocery sector. So really enjoyed talking to uh, Patrick Sisson from Commercial Observer. I want to thank him for giving me the opportunity. Um, but Omar, I know you've got a bunch of other stuff on your plate. Um, and one of the things that we've just wrapped up is the uh, industry conditions and sentiment survey. Uh, you want to share folk, with folks kind of a teaser finding uh, on that one? Yeah. So I'm taking this back to kind of the higher level uh, and overall broader capital markets. Um, just as we're, we're really seeing both central bankers and investors uh, really react to this, this higher for longer environment, uh, the CRE market participants uh, are, are doing the exact same, right? They, they're doing that as well. Uh, and so in our latest quarterly CRE industry conditions and sentiment survey, uh, participants indicated that, they, that uh, they're expected equity returns uh, are moderating slightly uh, as they, the cost of debt uh, is increasing slightly compared to the prior quarter. Uh, respondents' 12-month forward view of all-in fixed-rate financing increased moderately to a range of uh, 6.7 to 7.3 percent across uh, the main uh, portfolio strategies. Uh, that we that we ask them to identify as um, that, that's core, core plus, value add, and opportunistic. Um, and this is up about uh, 35 basis points on average uh, from the the Q1 2024 survey results. Um, this increase in, in debt costs or expected debt costs uh, was accompanied by a decrease in. Uh, their expected net returns to equity, which we measured uh, by reported net levered IRRs. Um, and the decrease in net levered IRRs was about 51 basis points on average compared to the prior quarter, right? So higher, higher debt costs, lower IRRs. Um, and the biggest shift we're really seeing in core plus and opportunistic strategies, uh, which they saw Net IRRs decrease uh, quarter over quarter by 73 basis points and 81 basis points, respectively. Now, what I think notable here is uh, that these shifts in, in CRE investor expectations really seem to mer mirror quite well with the broad capital market expectation shifts that we've seen across other asset classes. Um, and I think it really does seem to... Uh, reflect that the higher for longer, uh, you know, narrative. Um, uh, I think we entered this year, everybody chanting higher for longer, but at the same time, I think, you know, longer means longer. Uh, and so I, I think we're living through that now. One of the pieces that you, you know, and you'll be able to see all the data, all the charts, um, and we are planning on releasing the, the full results um, for the, the second quarter, uh, CRE industry conditions and sentiment survey results uh, around mid June, uh, so just a few weeks. Uh, but Cole, what else? Uh, what else can can folks look forward to uh, maybe before mid June? Yeah, so um, we've got uh, kind of the last remaining retailer earnings results coming through this week. Um, as a reminder, these are delayed by kind of a month uh, because they like to include the uh, 
holiday season in their first quarter or in their fourth quarter earnings. So they, they shift by a month. So we've got a bunch of big retailers coming by the time we will release the podcast. So Best Buy, uh, Kohl's, Dollar General, and Costco were all, will all be releasing their uh, first quarter results uh, this week by, by the 30th. So I'll be paying attention to a few of those and see if that can uh, kind of tell us a little bit more about what's going on in the retail sector. Um, but I know we've also got a bunch of data releases this week. Um, what, what will you be taking a look at? Yep. So we have uh, GDP on the 30th. We have uh, uh, incomes and outlays or, and, and the PCE data on the 31st. Um, and then also on the 30th, we have um, advanced goods trade balance and wholesale inventories. And, uh, you know, I'll be taking a look at a few this week. We've got more housing data. The uh, FHFA and the S&P Case-Shiller Index uh, both come out uh, actually as we're recording this. So I hopefully we'll get a chance to digest that in the next few days. Um, and then the pending home sales index uh, will be released on the 30th as well. Um, and there's some consumer data this week. Um, I know you touched on it when you mentioned the uh, outlay, income and outlays uh, and the PC price index and such. But uh, personal income and personal spending data will come out on the 31st. So we'll get another uh, good data point about the health of the uh, U.S. consumer. But a uh, lot to pay attention to this week, and I'm sure we'll be able to catch up about it next time we record. Uh, Omar, I do think that's all the time we've got today, but I look forward to speaking with you on another episode. Have a good one. Thank you.